I'm Helen, I'm here with Chikare and Chris and Sarah from Linden Dance. You've just seen the unboxed performance. Question is, what are the boxes that we're carrying around? What is our experience of bias? So Chikare, let's start with you. What experience have you had? What's in your box of lived experience of bias? Yeah, definitely. So what's in my box? My box is filled with being a woman, being a black woman, being a woman of color, being a woman who has got two black sons, um, being the only person who's ever been in the room who looks like me, having a very, very unusual name and people saying to me, why don't you have a normal name? You know, and just speaking to my sons and, you know, I think I wrote a blog about them about 15 years ago. And the blog was all about, you know, being cute when they, you know, not being cute anymore from going from cute to threat. And I think just, there's lots of things in my box. And I think when I think about my box, it's very, very stressful. Um, and this is why we need more people who are aware of these situations. This is why we need more allies. And could you share, Chi, if you're comfortable, some of the experiences you've had? We've talked about microaggressions, those things that happen that yeah. tell you you are othered, you are different. Could you share some of those ex yeah, examples? Yeah, definitely. Working at work and being told, um, why don't you have a normal name? Being renamed before, someone renamed me Christine once, and there's nothing wrong with the name Christine, but that's not my name. You know, not taken seriously as a person of colour. So going in to see a client and the junior person who's with me, people think that that person is, you know, more senior than I am. Um, going in to, um, to see a client and being shown to the back. So just little things like that. Thank you. And it's knowing that those are the experiences. We've said so much the power of listening. I haven't had those experiences. I need to hear those experiences from you to have any sense of yeah, the different boxes we carry around. Mm. Uh, Chris, you and I have spoken before about the experiences you've had and we've seen in your performance how that comes through. What are you living when you put that into the performance? What has been your experience of bias? So I think for me, there's been multiple experiences. Like I, I mean, I identify as a mixed race male. Um, I'm from Birmingham, I have a strong Birmingham accent. I've had, um, yeah, like, uh, I weirdly actually feel like I've had a privileged upbringing, but equally I know other people have had a more privileged upbringing. So it's important for me to understand that um, there are hardships, but there are also things that have been good for me. It's not all just bad, 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 but you know, I think I think the negatives and the positives are both inside my box. Um, I definitely feel there's a lot of uh, preconception around the way I look. So I think being mixed race and I'm not big, but I'm not small either. So being a mixed race male, you do uh, often, there's been moments where I've walked down the road and people will cross over the road. And I'm like, hmm, would have you crossed over the road if I didn't look the way I look? Um, there's been experiences where security guards have followed me round when I'm just doing normal shopping. And I'm like, well, I'm just shopping. And I've, I've explained before that um, I now always make sure to have a receipt with me when I'm leaving a shop. Whereas my wife, who is a white female, does not even consider that as a necessity. But I will, even to this day at 30 something years old, still make sure I have a receipt just so that I've got backup. So if anyone says anything, no, no. Um, what else has there been? There's been uh, aggressive male, aggressive black man, even though, like I say, I identify as a mixed race male. So I'm not fully black, I'm not fully white. I am mixed, which is fab. But um, yeah, it's, um, it's the, aggressive so I can't assert myself without being categorized as aggressive but equally um, I feel like I need a way to express myself so that's been put in the box as well uh, whether that's through experiences at school or experiences at university or even just not so much have I experienced it in the workplace but now I'm extremely cautious about how I present myself because any assertion could be thought of as aggressive and therefore it means that I am now very tentative and almost over polite, actually overcompensate mm -hmm. in the other direction to ensure that nothing I do can be misinterpreted. So in fact, it's having quite the effect that I'm now almost over polite, almost over people pleasy to ensure that I can't be put in the usual category that I am put in. So I think a lot of those experiences are in my box. And then one final one I'd like to highlight is just the uh, thought of being blamed for something that I haven't done. If I happen to be in, there was a really great example of when I was at school and the fire bell got set off 
for I was outside, but so was a lot of other people, but I was the one who got blamed for that. I went, in fact, another one where I was outside a chip shop and I matched the profile of someone who'd been doing burglaries, but I was actually at the chip shop for the past hour sat outside. So there's a million, million different examples of these little moments where oh, I must be him. It's got to be that one. But hey ho. So I think that's a lot of the stuff that uh, I carry around in my box. Thank you. And the the danger and the risk is how that affects you so it's one thing to listen to those stories and think that sounds unpleasant you told me before about almost feeling like well should i be that then if you think that should i should i become a criminal is that can you tell us more about that well yeah definitely if if people put that judgment on you are you like well, I may as well be. If I am aggressive, maybe, sorry, if you feel that I am aggressive, maybe I should be aggressive then. Or or if you think I'm going to steal, well, actually, when you turn your back, I will steal. Because, do you know what I mean? I never actually did that, but it's definitely puts the thought in your mind. Like, actually, oh, maybe I should then to, mm-hmm. as kind of like a, almost like, a, I don't know how to say it politely, but almost like a middle finger to to the person who's making that judgment. And it's like, if if I'm being judged as such, then therefore I shall become, which is ridiculous because actually it's not it's that's not the point. But yeah, it's almost like the more someone believes it, the more you either want to prove them right as a middle finger, but also kind of prove them wrong by not doing it. But then it feels like you've somehow lost by not doing it. I, d- I don't know. It's it's such a weird and uncomfortable thing to have placed on you for no reason basically yeah and that's the whole point with all of this right it's so uncomfortable it's so strange the way that it affects us is so bizarre in our in our minds and to to be aware of that again because we talk about the dangers the risks of bias is that it might encourage somebody to think well maybe i should be like that then that would be horrendous that we become somebody we're not because of the labels and boxes that we've got sarah how about for you what has been your lived experience what's coming across for you in the performance for me in the performance um i draw a lot on being a female and how that feels and how even Sadly, in 2024, I feel like we're still in a place where gender roles can actually be really divided and be really strict in language. Um, it is really powerful as, um, as children, you still often have all the girls go and do that and the boys go and do that. Well, actually, like, why? Why is there not a more of an, uh, an equal grounding on what um, females and males can do? Because that language goes into your mind as a child and you start to... Um, you start to believe that about yourself of like, just a silly one I remember as a child, like, no, the boys carry the chairs. Like the boys go and get the chairs and they pack them up. Well, that for me as a as a female, like tells you from a young age that you shouldn't expect any more of yourself. You should just stay in your box of where that should be. Or, you know, girls are so well behaved. So you're encouraged to fit in that box of being a people pleaser and a perfectionist and a, um, keeping the, keeping the peace and being, um, um, not being, uh, like running around or causing a fuss. And, and I think it's so, so powerful at that age that you, you grow and you believe it. And then as, um, even now I remember as a, as a teenager, as an, as an adult, there is an expectation of, uh, what you physically look like and, oh, it's, it's an important thing. So you better put makeup on and you better look that way and you better like take care of this. Well, like, although they're simple physical things that goes into your mind about how you, um, identify and how you, uh, see yourself as a woman and what you expect of yourself. And that very much puts you in that box. And if you try and break out of it, it then feels like there's more work. So I feel like that's in my side of, of the piece when I'm drawing on those are the personal experiences that I draw on, but also not just my gender, but also purely by the way I sound, like the way I speak, people expect a certain thing um, expect me to come from a certain background or to have had certain experiences when in reality they have no way of knowing what our lives have been like. And I really notice myself as I as I go around and I teach all over the country, I will change my accent because I I feel that people won't connect with me if, they, if I sound a certain way. Um, so I think it's just, it's all those things about where judgments are made or judgments are perceived about us that actually have no grounding. And I think what's been really interesting as well in the piece is also like mine and Chris's upbringings are very different. I grew up in Wiltshire, which is 
very undiverse and it's very um, rural and spread out. And you grew up in Birmingham in the middle of a city in a very different demographic. And the whole piece is us learning how to accept that actually we've had those those different upbringings and actually no, neither is wrong or right. Neither is good or bad. But then by combining those two shared experiences and allying ourselves with one another, we're then so much stronger because we understand the benefits and potentially the negatives or the footfalls that that upbringing has given us. It's so incredibly powerful to hear all of your experiences and Sarah, the language you've just used there about what do I expect of myself? Do I start to expect of myself that I can't lift a chair and that I maybe am a criminal and that maybe my sons can't have the same life as other young boys? You know, what do I start to expect mm. of myself? And this is the limitation that we and society, and it's interesting, is that, is that society putting that on me and then do I start to put it on myself? Uh, really yeah. challenging. Yeah. So I guess, as I understand you've done in some of the performances where you have the opportunity to ask people the question, what would be amazing now for people watching would be to consider well, what's in my box? What has my lived experience been? Where do I feel perhaps limited in who I can be and, and how I'm defined? And what might be in other people's boxes? Because we're all going to be different. And the more we can explore, what am I carrying around? And am I listening to other people? that's where we can start on this journey of allyship. 